Preparations must be made, they said. Now is the time. It was years ago, they shouted. Inaction was a crime. They said the dikes must be improved. Bringing peace and social justice issues into your living room piece by piece. I'm Pat Miner, your host, and we have with us this evening Sandra Stevens. And she's uh, made a trip early this year um, to Palestine, and she's going to tell us a little bit about her trip. Can you tell us a little bit about your background, your name, and in your... Okay. My name is Sandra Stevens, and I'm from Iowa City, Iowa, mm -hmm. and I went to Palestine in May and June. I uh, spent three weeks on the ground in the West Bank, Hebron, and the uh, South Hebron Hills in the village of Atwani, mm -hmm. and in East Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And I was a former firefighter and paramedic and uh, Army medical specialist back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in Pennsylvania, and I moved out to Iowa City to finish up my schoolwork at the university, and I now work at the university hospitals. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, we're going to look at some of the pictures that you did while wh that you took while you were there. But before we get to those, can you you want to tell us a little bit about? Um, did you have a particular interest in Israel Palestine um, when you were in the army? What did you think about this the issue during that period of your life? Uh, that period of my life was pretty heavily influenced by the U.S. media mm -hmm. and uh, kind of thought very little about the Palestinians, uh, the PLO, all the terrorism and things like that. And the whole situation in Palestine and Israel seemed like it was just a little bit too confusing, too mm -hmm. complex for any single person to really understand that it would have really taken a specialist kind of graduate degree mm -hmm. in diplomacy or something to get a full grip on it. Uh, so I really never had an interest in it. Um, when I joined the Mennonite Church, I encountered some people who were returning with uh, CPT from delegation experiences and working on the ground with uh, the Palestinians and Israelis, and I became interested in the subject matter. So I began reading extensively about uh, the situations from Israeli authors, Jewish authors, and from Palestinian authors uh, trying to get kind of an, un a bi an unbiased perspective, mm -hmm. or at least from trying to see it from both sides. Mm -hmm. And then I chose to uh, accept a position on a delegation to Palestine, mm -hmm. and I flew over there to see what's actually going on the ground and see what uh, activities CPT was doing, how they were mm -hmm. proceeding, and how they were carrying out their work and its effectiveness mm -hmm. in resolving the crisis in a small scale. Mm -hmm. And so you learned um, about the issue because you had met some people who were uh, in your church who'd been there recently, mm -hmm. and you started talking to them about it, and then you decided yeah. That, that you would look, do your own research and read about the issue extensively. Right. And then that um, got your interest up so, so that mm -hmm. you wanted to do it yourself. Um, CPT, just for our, our listeners, is Christian Peacemaker Teams. And in the interest of full disclosure, I should say that I have also been to Palestine with uh, Christian Peacemaker Teams. So um, just, you know, some of the site, same sites you've seen, mm -hmm. I've seen. So um, let's go ahead and look at some of those pictures. And these were, um, this was one of the first pictures that I took when I got to, um, arrived at um, Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. And as we were driving out to Jerusalem, and I was just struck by the number of Israeli flags that were mm. everywhere. And knowing because of what I had been told trying to get through the airport and being um, a peace delegate and going to the West Bank that I wasn't really kind of welcomed. And so I felt kind of unease yeah. when I saw so many of these patriotic kind of Israeli flags. Did you have any trouble getting through the airport, the, the checkpoint? Uh, no, I didn't, okay. fortunately. They didn't yeah. ask me too many questions, and mm -hmm. I just told them that I was going to visit the holy sites. Mm -hmm. So they were, it wasn't too bad. Mm -hmm. It wasn't quite as the interrogation that I had been led to believe. <laughs> yeah, that you had anticipated it yes. might be, yeah. 
Yeah, I think they, yeah, I remember <clears throat> they were, they just wanted us to be prepared so in case. Right. Yeah, and yeah. It, I'm glad it turned out well for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, and so when I was there, it made me also realize just if um, you're also a part of, a, in the United States, seeing uh, American flags everywhere, that if you mm -hmm. felt that you were perceived as um, a negative influence in America, being like an illegal alien or a marginalized um, person within this country, then you can really feel kind of anxious when you see all this um, un um, unbridled patriotism. Hmm. That's interesting. I never thought of, about that um, before, but yeah. Felt it made me appreciate a little bit maybe what some of the other people in our country go through uh -huh. when they see those things. Yeah. Interesting. So, uh, I don't know what the next picture is. <laughs> we have the next picture? Yeah. Um, I took a lot of photos on the way out and I tried to keep them in chronological order. So this is a map of the subway as I was going to O'Hare and we can just keep going through and I'll quickly try and uh, I went from Iowa City to Chicago on the mega bus and we can just keep going on these and a view of Chicago from the subway as we were going out from CPT over to the transfer point mm -hmm. and the wing of the Alitalia flight at the International Airport which was really exciting. I'd never flown east. I've always flown west. Uh -huh. I've been to Korea hmm. and Japan and places like that, but I've never gone to Europe or anything. Mm -hmm. And that was the plane. <laughs> and when we also got on the ground, we also saw a lot of English writing and a lot of Hebrew, but we didn't see any uh, Arabic signs. So we were traveling on a lot of Israeli roads, which are pretty exclusive for the Israelis and the Palestinians generally aren't allowed to travel on them. So this is signs for Sushia Meon, Carmel, and some of the other settlements in the West Bank. And one of the other things that really struck me was the ubiquitous nature of guard towers. And some of these towers when I was there I thought were actually not occupied and I got a little bit too close to the gates. and. I uh, had a rather warm reception from the Israeli soldiers who came out to tell us to move away from them. They weren't very happy with us being there. Mm. So this is just another design. So you can see all different colors. I also notice that close to the settlements, they tend to blend in a little bit more. They're a little bit less conspicuous. Mm. So I think that's to help the settlers feel a little bit more comfortable and less threatened. This, on our first day in Atuani, we were uh, going out with the delegation to see some of the damage that was done by the settlers from Maon on the uh, olive trees. And there was a young uh, Palestinian boy out in the lead with the flag, and we just kind of walked up the road uh, to the farm, the field where the olive trees were growing. Uh, on the other side of the valley, there was Israeli soldiers and some settlers who um, were observing us pretty much throughout and then followed us when we got too close to the border um, in fairly large numbers, I'd say about 20 to 30 soldiers. And Tuani is a small uh, village just south of the, of the Hebron Hills, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So. And then you can see here the Israeli soldiers in the background and the delegation leaders and some of the people from Operation Dove. Uh, the white uh, vehicle, white Land Rover, is the settlers. And there was also a lot of soldiers that were up in the tree lines watching. So they kept a uh, pretty close eye on us. They took a lot of photos of us and they were fairly heavily armed, at least with uh, M16s um, and things like that. So this was some of the delegation as we we're uh, getting ready to go down into the valley. We were getting some of the debriefing about some of the things that we could expect from the settlers and the soldiers before we actually went down into the olive orchard. The CPTers are wearing <coughs> the red hats. The red hats. And mm -hmm. the, the others, the, the Palestinians. The, four, the Palestinians are in the front, in mm -hmm. the front of the picture. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, 
and that's uh, me and one of the delegation leaders uh, looking at some of the damaged trees. Apparently they don't damage the roots or the main trunk of the tree. They just try and uh, economically hurt them by cutting down some of the main branches. And I guess that can be quite a bit of money uh, lost per tree and that can really impact the quality of the life of the Palestinian mm -hmm. farmer who's growing and collecting and harvesting the olives. For olives and olive oil as well? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I, one of the things that I liked was looking at the doors of the cave entrances in the older buildings. A lot of the Palestinians lived inside the caves because of the hot temperature and the cold climate during the winter, so they have these doors. They also, uh, when they weren't using the caves to live in, I guess they also used them as mangers mm -hmm. or uh, animal, uh, safe animal housing. So they would put the animals in some of these. And there was a um, uh, lot of these cave doors all over the place. So I saved a lot of pictures mm -hmm. of the different doors. I went into some of the caves and you can still see fingerprints and things yeah. on the walls. And some of them were quite elaborate and very beautiful. This is a traditional building that was behind the uh, quarters for the CPT um, people who are working on the ground and it's a more traditional stone and mud uh, building. And just another cave. These were some of the soldiers during our uh, action uh, to the olive grove. They were observing us with uh, binoculars and things. They were pretty prevalent all over the place. They really kept us from going anywhere near the tree line. And the white vehicle, again, is the settler vehicle, which is in back. All of these are heavily armored um, British Land Rovers. And all of the Israeli soldiers were armed with M16 A1 rifles. Um, I think they were a hybrid design. Mm. Uh, they're pretty, pretty contemporary and very nice weapons. Mm. And most of them came from the United States, I understand. Absolutely. Well, we missed the picture of the little boy. Wasn't there a little boy there? Yeah. yeah. This is a little boy from the Atwani uh, village, and he was just a cute boy. All the children like to come up and get their photographs taken, and then they want to see the back of the uh, camera so they can see what their picture looked <laughs> yeah, like. Yeah, right. They're beautiful children. Mm -hmm. This is a traditional uh, dressed uh, Palestinian woman who is taking her goats and sheep out. Uh, to graze. Uh, her son is behind her and her white covering over her head uh, denotes that she has been on the Hajj and she's wearing a traditional embroidery on her dress. Do you want to explain what the Hajj is? The Hajj is going out to Mecca and doing the walk around um, the central stone building there and it's something that uh, there's several different things that all Muslims have to do or need to do during their lifetime. Mm -hmm. So when they go to the Hajj, they can uh, begin wearing the white covering. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah. It's always interesting to see the, the sheep and the goats going mm -hmm. out. They, they do it traditionally. They have, you know, that woman is a shepherd. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the reasons that CPT is there is also that a lot of the settlers will attack the children mm -hmm. who are um, with the goats and herding and things like that. One of the Operation Dove, or actually CPT persons, was recently attacked and hit with a pipe and needed to be hospitalized oh, after really? an attack mm. from the settlers. Mm. Hadn't heard about that. Yeah. yeah. So. And Whoops, so, let's go back to the one with the, yeah. This was the woman who was running the Atwani Women's Cooperative. Mm -hmm. A lot of embroidery, a lot of uh, handiwork and things like that that they were offering for sale mm -hmm. to provide a supplemental income for their families. Mm -hmm. And she's a wonderful cook mm -hmm. and gracious host. This is uh, several of the uh, Palestinian children in Atawani taking the goats out uh, to graze. And these are the children that get attacked by the settlers. 
they also attack the livestock as well, it can damage or kill, injure the uh, livestock. They also put poison, uh, have been known to put poison out in the grass and things, warfarin, which can cause internal hemorrhage and kill uh, the livestock. Yeah, that so had can, happened just just before I went there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we went out into the fields, we could see the, the little pellets yeah, on the, the ground. Yeah, pink pellets. Yeah. Of, and uh, so basically, again, it becomes the settlers are um, attacking the quality of life and the economic uh, support for the Palestinians in an effort to try and get them to relinquish the land. Mm -hmm. This is the road which goes through the settlements and it's the shortest distance from Tuba to Atwani. Tuba is a smaller village uh, north of Atwani and Mayon and the children from Tuba have to walk this long road down through the settlement and are frequently attacked by the settlers and injured and the CPT people used to escort them on this journey but the Knesset decided after the internationals were attacked and needed hospitalization that the Israeli soldiers would escort them through the settlements but even the soldiers get attacked and the one incident that I was told about was that the soldiers were attempting to put the children into the armored car to protect them from the attacking settlers and the settlers attacked the soldiers mm -hmm. and one of the soldiers discharged his firearm to try and get the settlers to move away from him and the soldier was punished for his action mm -hmm. but they did protect the children from harm and they're actually many of the soldiers are very very kind to the children give them water and uh, really take good care of them when they're uh, coming through. Some maybe not so much, but I think that a lot of the soldiers are actually, can be very caring. So there's some credit that needs to be given to many of the Israelis. Mm -hmm. so, so you can see the soldiers um, bringing the children down. The children in Tuba. In who Tuba. Travel the road to at 20 because they're going to school every right. day, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is another um, one of the children. And you can see the trees up in the top uh, left-hand corner of the image, and that is the settlement of Mayon. And so these are all their goats, and they go up and kind of fun to walk around with them because there's so many pottery shards and so many artifacts laying on the ground uh, that as you're walking around you can s see all these things that are just incredible sights. Mm -hmm. This is the owner of the orchard of uh, the olive trees with his uh, daughter. That is one of them, the women is his wife and his brother is with them and they kind of live in a communal home. And they live closest to the settlements of Mayon. These are their children. And this is a, a view of the uh, uh, village of Atawani. And there's a lot of goats in there. Uh, this was one of the leaders of the delegation. And over her shoulders you can see the um, Israeli IDF vehicles. And the trees is the settlement of Mayon. And they were explaining how the uh, settlers were expanding uh, the settlement by placing a new tent out on the eastern portion of the settlements and then planting trees and how they were going to progressively begin to take more and more of the land towards the east. It towards Tawani? Uh, actually, not towards Tawani, oh, more towards the Dead Sea. Okay. And these are some of the trees that were damaged and some of the women that were helping to repair, trim the trees back and dig trenches around it so that they could supply the uh, trees with some additional water. So we were there basically to kind of document what had happened and also provide some physical and emotional support for the Palestinians in helping to clean clean out some of the brush 
in debris that had been caused by the damage. The day before that we got there to Atawani, the Israeli intelligence service had gone to some of the leaders, particularly this guy, and um, explained to him that the internationals had to leave and that they had to stop their resistance and threaten children and threaten them. And that was with only, I think, two or three or four uh, internationals in Atawani. So the next day when our delegation of eight to ten more people showed up, I think that it was kind of a pretty strong statement that we weren't going to be leaving anytime yeah. soon. So did did anyone did you stay overnight or did you just spend a day there? We spent several days there you did, in the you quarters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then in the last week of the three weeks that I was there I went back down to Atawani and stayed mm -hmm. uh, several more days there to mm -hmm. kinda practice and see what uh, the C P T people, what life was like for C P T when they were there yeah. working day to day in some of the missions that they were carrying out. So it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And this is kind of what we did with the uh, helping the trench around the tree um, and just water it and care for it. The tree roots actually, the, the main trunk is actually much older than many of the branches. And you'll see later there's one tree, olive tree, that's over 2,000 years old that actually was, you know, could have been, Jesus actually could have actually wow. walked through and eaten olives off of this tree. It's just an amazing it's, thing. Yeah, right? it is. It's I mean, it's hard incredible. for me to, can we go back to that olive tree picture? The one with the, yeah. It just amazes me that this thing is still alive. I mean, to mm -hmm. me, that looks like it would just die. Yeah. But, but it's still alive. It's still alive. So, and they can trim that back and it will actually grow more uh, branches out and it will actually become a tree again. Wow. Well, that's good. This is one of the cisterns that they use to water the plant, the olive groves with. So they'll drop buckets down and this collects rainwater from the surrounding area. And it, water is one of the <clears throat> issues. Big issues. Yeah. Uh, because water is one of the rarest commodities there and a lot of the Palestinians really struggle to maintain an adequate adequate hydration to mm -hmm. at least to the UN standards. Mm -hmm. So they have um, to really kind of work at it, collecting water and cisterns. And Atwani is also just now getting a uh, water pumped in now from mm -hmm. outside sources. Oh, great. And uh, it, part of the problem is that settlements like my own um, are sitting on some of the aquifers mm -hmm. and so they get the water that belongs to the Palestinians right. and then you know sometimes they have to buy water right. buy their own water from the Israelis mm -hmm. right? right and also the Israelis can drill uh, deeper wells but the Palestinians right. can only drill so far down and well above what the Israelis can so the Israelis are able to drain the water level down mm -hmm far enough and again it's just an attack on the quality of life mm -hmm. uh, to try and get the Palestinians to move you know so that they're not actually trying to kill anybody they're just trying to continually assault uh, their life so that they can have no other choice but to leave yeah. and the 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 people in Atawani have stayed there I mean the village used to contain a lot more people than it did. Mm -hmm. you know, one of the things you were pointing out was the different caves, and the caves used to be full of people, mm -hmm. right? And now they're not because right. um, so many of the villagers have left because it was too difficult for them. Mm -hmm. This is the interior of the quarters, uh, the office of CPT at in Atawani, and they do have internet through um, mobile phone and it gets pretty hot during the summer mm -hmm. that's just got a tin roof on it mm -hmm. and boy it really was uh, pretty broiling in there you would have to spend most of your time outside yeah so and that's the women's quarters where the office is and where the kitchen was and the next picture is the men's quarters <laughs> which is pretty fairly primitive but it's not 
not too bad, uh, especially with a fan on. Yeah, it's amazing you have electricity. When we were there, there was no electricity. Like, yeah, so. So at least they were able to hook up to the grid mm -hmm. um, not too long ago. Yeah, not too long Less ago. Less than a year ago? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's so, been pretty amazing. It's nice that they have a fan at least. Yeah. yeah. So that's cool things. And refrigerators? Do they have refrigerators? They have refrigerators now. Yeah. Yeah. And they have a lot of different things, a lot of different amenities. So they're really, um, I think some of the things that their struggle is paying off. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so they're, they're determined to stay there in their homes and the land that they've had for generations. Mm -hmm. And it's quite a struggle. I just can't even imagine mm -hmm. the, the things they go through. And when they were putting in the water, um, one of the things that they found at Tawani is actually built on a uh, Byzantine uh, city and mm -hmm. had an, a strong Roman occupation. And I believe that this was a bath for the mm -hmm. Romans. There's a lot of tiles in here and some different things like that that uh, they had dug up over the last week that we were there. Hmm. This is a mortar stone where you have the pestle hmm. where you can grind up grains and things like that. They found some columns um, and that was like grape leaves that were at the top of the columns. Hmm. So that's just some of the tile that they had found. Hmm. And this is a view of Atwani and Mayon in the valley uh, in between and off in the distance is to the west uh, to Yata, which is the nearby town. Mm -hmm. And this is another picture of the soldiers following us as we we're getting ready to walk back down into Atwani. This is a Bedouin uh, home. Uh, this place, this location, uh, an Israeli uh, had brought us out to this location and here, uh, there were 55 homes hmm. that uh, on land that the Israelis had designated for the Bedouins. And what ended up happening was they decided to move these people and they came in one day with bulldozers and they plowed the entire 55 homes into the wadi, into the small valley oh, next door and covered it up with dirt. And they've been coming in routinely, repeatedly, and destroying whatever they build there. So they've reduced it down to two by fours and uh, tarps. And when they have, the, when they see the Israelis coming, what they'll do, if you go to the next picture, I believe it's, they'll go into this cemetery that's off in the distance in the trees and uh, the Israelis won't attack them in the cemetery. Mm -hmm. But all of the land that you see in the foreground is basically the burial place of this village that was completely destroyed. I see on our screen now we've popped up our <laughs> time, I don't know, or our, our telephone number. Does that mean we're at 30 minutes? Yeah, we're at 30 minutes now. Okay. So, so we're halfway through the show and if you want to call and join the conversation, we'd urge you to do that. Our phone number, as you can see on your screen, is 319-338-8456. And I want to remind you that I'm Pat Miner, your host of Piece by Piece, and our guest this evening is, is Sandra, Sandra Stevens. Stevens. So, and we're talking about her trip with Christian peace, peacemaker teams to Palestine. So if we want to continue discussing that, We were just talking mm -hmm. about the mm -hmm. how when the Israelis come, it looks to me, do they do they set the tents down then when the Israelis come? Is that what the, is going on there? Um, I think that they can pack up the tents fairly okay. quickly, but they're fairly disposable at this point. Mm -hmm. They're not, uh, they don't have a lot of uh, value placed into them because they can be destroyed so quickly and so easily. So they try and keep everything pretty much on the cheap. A lot of rugs, so they just roll out all the rugs. It's basically a Bedouin style yeah. uh, lifestyle. <clears throat> so, and this is just a view of some of the uh, relics that have come up through the ground after the uh, destruction of the village. Mm. And this was the uh, Israeli gentleman who had brought us out to show and explain and translate for us 
uh, about what was going on with the Bedouins. He took us through the Negev and really explained a lot of what was going on and how uh, different Israeli groups are actually advocating for the Bedouins and how the Bedouins have been struggling to try and maintain their lifestyle and maintain their existence in the homeland of their ancestors. Mm -hmm. and in Israel. In, in what, Israel, what in what Israel, they call yeah. Israel. And so it was one of the things that really impressed me before I went over there. I was very disappointed uh, with the Israelis as a whole. I was, I was quite upset with that. And when I got over there, I was um, refreshed to see that there was a large percentage of the Israeli population which are really supporting the Palestinians mm -hmm. in helping them to acquire equal rights, to maintain their homes and their land, and to be able to provide for them. And the Palestinians were, who are working with them respond with you know, nonviolence and peace, and they're working together. Mm -hmm. And I think if there's ever peace to be obtained in the Israeli-Palestine situation, it won't come from the governments. It'll come from the people and the people mm -hmm. of both sides. Mm -hmm. And I really give a lot of hope, and I'm very proud of both sides. Mm -hmm. that they've been able to do so much good work mm -hmm. in trying to help each other uh, attain peace. Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult proposition uh, mm -hmm. when, you know, it, there, ha there are not as many, what I'm hearing anyway, is that there aren't as many Israelis, you know, that believe in peace now as there used to be. But mm -hmm. um, there is definitely a very strong segment of the population that's, that is advocating for peace and doing really good work with Wonderful it. Wonderful work, yeah. right. And it, maybe this is a little bit of a, of a, we're going a little bit off the subject here of your trip, but mm -hmm. I was just reading the other day we had um, that uh, settler, or I'm sorry, the prisoner exchange. Mm -hmm. You know, Gilad Shalit is coming home mm -hmm. and they have exchanged a thousand, mm -hmm. about a thousand prisoners, Palestinian prisoners. and. Uh, one of the people, the Israelis that's been working that on that, uh, is an, a man named Gershon Baskin, who mm -hmm. actually was here in Iowa City. Okay. And so I, I got a chance to meet Gershon, and um, it was really, it is interesting that, um, you know, so, some people say, you know, I, one of the things I read was uh, a man said, well, you know, now now we can now it's official, you know that. Um, one Israeli life is worth a thousand Palestinian mm. lives. And I said, well, to me, it's a matter of, of thinking that um, that this, uh, that finally the, the Israelis are admitting that they have so many prisoners, mm -hmm. you know, that um, the, the, the Palestinians hold one Israeli soldier, mm -hmm. and he's a soldier. Mm -hmm. And the and the Israelis hold thousands of Palestinian prisoners, mm -hmm. and so they were willing to release one thousand of them to get this one soldier back. Mm -hmm. And I'm not I'm not sure what that means, but at least, you know, as you say, there are some Israelis and some Palestinians willing to work together. And it was Hamas they worked with, which right. is, you know, one of the things that mm -hmm. people talk about is that, you know, you can't work with Hamas, you can't bargain with Hamas, but mm -hmm. it seems to me that Hamas is at least, represents at least half of the Palestinian people. Absolutely. You know, and that you need, you need to, to deal with them, and it was really interesting to me that this deal came through at this particular point yeah. in time. So it'll be interesting to see what happens, if anything, mm -hmm. comes out of, out of this fact that they were able to get this piece done. Yeah. So I hope good comes out of it. So yeah. for both sides. Yeah. Well, I did some talking there. Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> so we can continue with the photos yeah. if you want. So these are some of the uh, uh, Bedouin homes oh, okay. uh, built in corrugated steel mm -hmm. uh, near a toxic chemical plant or a power company and toxic waste dump. These are the and ones that the Israelis built. These are the ones that the Bedouins have built. Okay. Some of these are, uh, quote, illegal settlements mm -hmm. in villages um, built on traditional homes for the uh, Bedouins. And you can keep going. This is a soccer field. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. You can see there's no garbage pickup in these locations mm. and there's very little water supply or electricity or anything that's um, routinely applied. Mm. So they were providing us with tea and this was how they were cooking it in this big open fire pit inside of a tent and it was quite the thing. This is a Palestinian flag flying in um, Bethlehem, mm -hmm. in a segment of Bethlehem. And I thought that, that it was kind of, I had to wait for about a half an hour for the wind to finally catch the flag mm. and show it fully streaming. So this was right near the uh, Church of the Nativity. Mm -hmm. And that's the interior of the Church of the Nativity. This is a road that uh, is near Hebron, and this is one of the reasons that CPT was actually asked to come into um, Palestine. And what was happening was, in a couple of pictures ahead, you'll see a fig tree, and the settlers there were hiding in the fig tree and attacking the children that were going uh, to school. And the children had to take this very, very long road out past to avoid going anywhere near the settlements. So they asked P CPT, this is the fig tree, they asked CPT to come down and walk with the children and become an international presence to document what was going on. So CPT on their first day decided that they would go and sit underneath the fig tree and when the settlers came down to hide in the fig tree they found CPT was um, located already there so they ended up leaving. Nearby, there's also a home that a woman, sh this woman here in this home, uh, sheltered some of the children and the Israelis decided that they needed to destroy the home. Mm -hmm. uh, they found a reason that there was something illegal about it, so they destroyed her home and destroyed the sister. And I think in the next picture, you'll see that this used to be her cistern for her water supply. So it would gather the rainwater. And so when they destroyed her home, they also destroyed the cistern so that she couldn't collect any water. <clears throat> this is the woman who owns the home. And so she doesn't really want to put any investment into her home because she's worried about it being destroyed again. Mm -hmm. These are some of the children that walked to school and they were out harvesting some of their uh, crops. And they were laughing and carrying on and they were uh, working the fields. This is a donkey that was uh, tethered near the road that they walk. And this is the city of Hebron, uh, looking from the top of the roof of the CPT offices and apartments. You can see all the mosques, and the Abram Mosque is in the middle of the foreground with the serrated wall. Uh, and that's where a lot of uh, activity, and it's one of the few joint, uh, jointly I used facilities for both Muslim and Jewish people, and it's also the site near where the settlements are for um, the students and the people who uh, venerate this mosque and temple. <laughs> this is Babiyar, the square right near the old city, and I thought that this building, it's kind of a triangle shape, and I thought it was just very, very interesting, interesting. and very, very unique. Uh, it's all closed off because it's a security risk and it's a military zone. So none of the shops are actually open and it's no longer used or occupied, which is just tragic. Mm -hmm. This is a scene of Hebron in the morning. Uh, it's a beautiful place and it's very cool in the morning. And it stays pretty cool all day because the cold air comes down through all the staircases and the alleyways. And all these shops will open up throughout the day and it becomes just a crowded marketplace uh, that's just a wonderful place to be. This is another view of the rooftop of uh, the CPT offices in Hebron. Uh, to the left you can see it's an abandoned building and on top of it there's that small square that you can barely see. That's a soldier's observation post uh, right near where the uh, military offices are for the IDF. And across the street there is a mosque. That's the wall, the separation wall that goes around that keeps the uh, settlers and the Palestinians separate. On the left side is the CPT office. And the, uh, this area here, you can see that there's a uh, guard tower. And this is called the Dead City. And all of these buildings, all of these uh, shops 
and homes have been abandoned uh, by military order so that they could protect and create a security zone for the Israeli settlers. So there's several hundreds if not thousands of shops that have been closed down. They're all welded shut. You can see the guard tower at the end of that road and some of the wall that separates it. And it just continues and there's just this long line of um, empty buildings that are all closed down and it's very very sad there's a lot of demonstrations I believe to reopen the street and reestablish these marketplaces this is a line where the Israeli settlers drive on the left side of the road and the Palestinians can walk on the right side but they're not allowed to um, um, venture very much further into the um, the dead city. This was a dog sitting on one of the uh, Israeli checkpoints. I was about to leave um, Palestine that day and I saw this dog up there and the soldier said that I could take a picture of it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. soon was after... Was it their dog? No, it was just a stray dog and it jumped down soon after and walked off and you could see that it had some puppy somewhere mm -hmm. and it was kind of cute. So. Mm -hmm. This building struck me because it's one of the abandoned buildings, but it also has on the side of it forgiveness, mm -hmm. which is in the next picture. You can see it's uh, larger writing. This was part of the patrol area for CPT in the evening. They would take a routine patrol out around the uh, Abrams Mosque. This is going out with the Israeli soldiers on patrol, and they frequently will uh, take any young Palestinian male and stop them, put them up against the wall, ask them for ID, search them, and detain them for extended periods of time so that they can basically kind of harass them. I've seen several people that maybe like six times during the short time that I was there being stopped. You for know, no it's just For reason. no apparent reason, they're just walking through their hometown and they just get stopped. Every time they encounter a patrol, they're stopped, they're asked for their ID, and they have no idea if they're gonna be taken to the police station and interrogated, or if there's a particularly nasty soldier that they'll be dragged off into an alley and beaten up. And several of the soldiers, because I was talking to them since I was former military and things, I told them about my military experience. Mm -hmm. And so I got to be a little bit of friends with some of them and they said that they were glad that CPT was there mm -hmm. because it keeps people on the up and up. And even mm -hmm. though we're annoying to them, it's necessary. Interesting, so. that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So this is another patrol. They had stopped a young boy. Uh, up at the other end okay. and you can see him up there. Yeah. So while they're um, waiting for his identity card to clear, they create a security partition around him so they have soldiers placed at one end of the alley and one other end of the alley with pairs and things. I'm amazed that they like <coughs> to take those pictures. Yeah, I was too. Yeah. So this is part of the Israeli uh, garrison uh, the IDF garrison in Hebron, right across the street from the CPT offices. This is another guy. I saw him get stopped quite a few times. Um, <clears throat> I think it's worth reminding our viewers that um, these soldiers are on Palestinian land, mm -hmm. stopping Palestinians in their own right. land. Absolutely. You know, th like you said, it was just walking Now this down picture the here is very important. On the left-hand side, the buildings are settler buildings. And what was happening was the settlers were throwing garbage and a variety of different materials down on top of the Palestinians who were shopping in the market. And it got so bad, they ended up having to put up like a roof to keep the materials from hitting the people below. Um, so that all through Hebron, wherever you can see the settlers uh, occupy one side of the street, they had to put like chain link fence and plastic and tarps and things like that to keep things from falling on top of people and getting hurt. Yeah, we were told that, you know, they had to put the plastic because when mm -hmm. they just had the fencing, they'd that throw they would feces throw, yeah, and feces urine. And urine and mm -hmm. tea, and hot tea, yeah. things like that, down onto so, the, onto the uh, Palestinians, Palestinians that are trying to shop in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So this is uh, one of the CPT delegates, uh, the people who are working full time there. Uh, her name was Paulette. She was a Franciscan nun, and there were some children who wanted their picture taken. And she was amazing. She would go up to the Israeli soldiers, and she would just be right in their face, and uh, she would just call them on everything. But I think that everybody, Israeli soldiers, Palestinians alike, uh, really just had great admiration and respect for her because mm -hmm. of her integrity and her ability to diffuse situations mm -hmm. and make things a little bit easier for everybody. She just really was a blessing. Mm -hmm. so. This mm -hmm. was a sign that was painted by the Palestinians near the settlements and it was whitewashed the next day. So you can see where it says Free Palestine and that was covered up and they were trying to show um, do you know what the Arabic says? Does it say no, I, I don't. I wish I could speak Arabic. This is a roadblock. They tried to close off the Palestinian access to Israeli roads. They don't want the Palestinians crossing over. So what they do is they drive around the roadblocks and through them and they just move some of the blocks a little bit to make it just enough that they can actually get through and so they can scoot across the road. So they don't have to drive miles and miles and miles. And I believe that the Israelis probably allow it, but it just makes it a little bit harder for people. This is one of the road blockages near the settlements in one of the guard towers. You can see barbed wire and fences and roadblocks and towers are just everywhere. Wherever you go, if you really don't know how to navigate around through, like as a Palestinian, um, you can get really lost in trying to figure out where you're not supposed to be, where you're supposed to be, and it's just yeah. this maze of different passages and places to go. The um, Palestinian taxi drivers really understood how to get, mm -hmm. get around. This is another one of the chain link fences and some of the corrugated steel, a close up of the, the guard tower. And you would think that there wasn't anybody in there, but they were always very, very close. If you got too close to these things or you tried to look inside them, they would be right on top of you. It was amazing mm -hmm. how fast they got there. And again, some more of the children harvesting. This was one of the caves at the Tent of the Nations. I was going to say, I recognize that place. Yeah, and this is, this shows kind of the quality of the interior of some of the caves that you see. There's poured concrete floors and it was actually whitewashed and it was actually very clean, very dry. And they had stoves with pipes going up through the ceiling. And it was very cool when we were there during some of the hotter days. And it was also very warm at night. So it was kind of an interesting contrast. Hmm. So it always stayed kind of a relatively constant temperature. Mm -hmm. So that was really, really nice. These are some of the graffiti of some of the wall that is dividing East Jerusalem um, and some of the stuff that had been spray painted on it. The dirt whispered. Go back there, I'm reading that poetry. <laughs> oh man, it's going the wrong direction. Yeah, I think it's on auto. -pilot. There we go. The dirt whispered, child, I'm coming. Love conquers all. Home? Yeah, I'm no, coming, I'm coming home. home. The Love dirt whispered, all. I'm coming home. Yeah. Love conquers all. Prayer for prayer for, for refugees. refugees. And um, then the next picture, this is the Wailing Wall, um, which was pretty impressive. I've never seen this, anything like that. It's much larger than what I had anticipated. Mm. Um, this was the mosque that's on top of the uh, Temple Mound, and that was at night. And this is walking the Via Della Rosa. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. These are in Jerusalem. These are in Jerusalem. And this is the grotto where the cross was supposedly placed. And this is the slab of stone that Jesus was reported to have been laid on and cleaned after he was crucified. And this is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the actual tomb on the inside. Uh, there's, during an earthquake, a lot of it had been disrupted because it wasn't really built very well. And they had to put steel I-beams mm -hmm. and iron I-beams and kind of support it. There's only room for about three people in there, four mm -hmm. people at the most, and it's like a little tunnel. Mm -hmm. And we have hundreds and hundreds of people who are trying to get in there. So it's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. 
and that's the Damascus Gate and that was finally uncovered. It was all covered with uh, tarps and they were doing a lot of uh, sandblasting and repairing of the facade. Yeah, that's and, since I was been there. Mm -hmm. And so that was all removed and this was the morning that I was leaving. Yeah. Um, and you can see the stone reflected mm -hmm. all throughout the city of Jerusalem and even in Hebron there's this like white limestone yeah. um, that's very slick and uh, it's really hard and it uh, covers everywhere and it drains really well and it was very interesting to see the interior of how this was designed. I remember I was keeping a journal at the time going through that and one of the first entries was everything is stone here. Yes, so absolutely. It's all stone, which is, you know, kind of nice because here when it rains it gets muddy. You know, mm -hmm, there. Mm -hmm. It cleans things. Absolutely. So that was kind of nice, I remember. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. this was on the way home mm -hmm. and um, in the wing. And uh, so this is a segment of East Jerusalem. And we had gone on a tour with some Israelis who were explaining some of the things that were going on. You can see the wall being constructed mm -hmm. off in the distance. <clears throat> And this was one of the Israelis who had explained uh, what was going on there, that the Palestinians pay 65% of Jerusalem's taxes. The sewer system is from the 15th century and has never been upgraded. There's no garbage collection there. Water is only turned on in the evening, and they have to have cisterns on top of the buildings. If they attempt to do any repairs to the houses, what can happen is they will get a demolition order because you need permits and they never issue permits, so if you don't have a permit, you're in against the law. So they'll give you a destruction order for your home. And when they decide to finally tear down your home, they'll tear down the building, they give you very little warning, and then they load up all the debris into the trucks, and then the last thing that they do before they leave is hand you the bill for it. So you have to pay for the destruction of your own home because you were in violation of the law and you didn't have a permit. And this was in this is in East Jerusalem? This is in East Jerusalem, and this is the process that they use to be able to get rid of the Palestinians from the land because it's worth a fortune. If they can open up that land for... Um, normal Israeli citizens that come in from all over the world, from the United States and different places, they stand to make billions and billions of dollars off of this. Mm -hmm. And so they need, but they need to, as uh, has been stated before, they need to get rid of the indigenous population to be able to take over that land. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the big goals is, and they just announced that they're building another 1,100 uh, units of uh, apartments and buildings over there and they have plans for many many more so it's really yeah a it tragedy. just amazes me I mean I mean you know I mean the whole peace process you know mm -hmm. they talk about the peace process and they the United States says stop building settlements and Netanyahu says nope not gonna do it yep. we're gonna build another 1100 over here yeah it's like Obviously, the United States has no sense of power over them whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's a real tragedy, and it makes it very difficult for both sides to be able to negotiate in good faith because, you know, the Palestinians can't go to the Israelis and make and negotiate without coming back and looking like fools. And then the Israelis can't really say that they're being honest in the uh, negotiation process if they're building all these and they're not stopping any of the settlements and things like that. So it really becomes this difficult process. So it was interesting also to see Israelis who are actually out there explaining what's going on. And they were working for this. Um, they were advocating for the Palestinians and it really gave me hope that there's a lot of people out there that are working towards peace. Yeah, when Gershon Baskin, the man I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. um, was here, one of the things he said, that I mean, he's an Israeli, right? mm -hmm. and one of the things he said that just, I mean, I, I had sort of felt this way, but I'd never, just to hear an Israeli say it was really powerful to me. He said, he said, um, as far as the the obligations, uh, according to the Oslo Accords, mm -hmm. the Palestinians had fulfilled every obligation 
of the, of the Oslo Accord in order to have a state, and the Israelis had filled none of them. Right. So that was just, you know, that like you said, for Israelis to be saying that was really, it was a powerful statement for me mm -hmm. to hear that from him. Yeah. And it's just, you know, it's just amazing to me that the, the United States government is still acting as if Israel is doing the right thing. And right. it's just, a, I can't understand it. Yeah, and that's why I think that if peace is going to be found in the Middle East, especially in Israel and Palestine, the only people who are going to be able to carry out that peace process are the people who live there, mm -hmm. who are um, working towards it. The average citizen, the person who is uh, out there drumming for uh, equal rights, who are advocating for equal rights and uh, peace on both sides. Just the common people, mm -hmm. not the governments. The governments, I think, are going to be, um, will never be able to get it and never be able to do it in good faith. But the common people, I think, can actually achieve uh, a groundswell and actually influence everything. Yeah, we used to call it, um, uh, oh, I can't remember what we called it, but you'd get just enough people to, to shift the balance right. you know, in, in favor of peace. And that's, I think, that's the only way true peace is going to come about. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that the Israeli government, the U.S. government, uh, the Palestinian government uh, is really going to be capable of doing it, but the average common person will be able to achieve it. Does that include you and me? Absolutely. And what can Absolutely. we do? Absolutely. We can write to uh, the people in our government. Mm -hmm. um, we can call in. We can write letters. Mm -hmm. uh, we can support uh, the people who are active in nonviolent resistance in the peace process. We can talk to our churches mm -hmm. and tell them to learn about what's really going on and stop giving money to people who are not going to support nonviolent resistance and support equal rights for all people, regardless of their race or their religion or things like that. And then we'll be able to start really seeing some movement forward, I believe. Mm -hmm. But it'll take a little bit of time, but I have a lot of hope that peace in the Middle East is actually possible. I hope you're right. I, I sometimes lose hope. It's nice to to talk to you and get and, and have a little bit of hope. Uh, we can you can get more information by um, going to the CPT website, which mm -hmm. is www.cpt.org. And I think we have that on a slide too. If we can put that up on our screen, and they will keep you up to date on all the things that are going on daily with the CPT team and some of the, uh, they don't get involved in politics too much, but no. they, they will let you know what's going on with the children mm -hmm. you were talking about. Mm -hmm. They'll let you know what's going on with App mm -hmm. um, Some of the things that they have apartments in Hebron, mm -hmm. mentioned. And At Tawani. And they also have a lot of resources with a lot of Israelis. Um, we met a tremendous number of really Israeli citizens, uh, observant Jews and things like that, who were working in the peace process. Mm -hmm. And so they have connections on both sides. Rabbis for Human <coughs> Rights. Mm -hmm. And all these um, Irish women in black. Mm -hmm. um, there's, I mean, it was just, it was so wonderful mm -hmm. to see all these people being involved and mm -hmm. see the universal nature for the desire of peace. Mm -hmm. It was just um, heartwarming, so at least for me. And how would you care, oh, we don't have much time here. How, I guess we, I was gonna say, um, do you have any final words? Uh, support peace, support. and support peace starts at home with your coworkers, mm -hmm. with everybody that you encounter. Talk to everybody so, you know about the about peace it, process. Yeah, about the peace process, and work towards peace um, at every point in your life, mm -hmm. whether it's individual, at your home, with your coworkers, um, with people driving Find down the street with you. More. Work to peace. Thanks a lot, Sandra. You're welcome. <laughs> Preparations must be made, they said. Now is the time. It was years ago they shouted. Inaction was a crime.